Hey everybody, I'm back with another video. Continuation of the statistics portion. So this will be part three. Right now it's 4.20 in the morning, so excuse me if I sound a little tired. Okay, so here are the topics that will be discussed today um, for your information. So let's begin right away. Okay, here we go. So dependent versus independent variables. Now, dependent variables are simply variables that change based on something. Okay, so these variables, something causes them to change. All right, and this is usually what they want to measure in the research, right? The intervention to see what the intervention changes. So I got a good example here for you. So if a study is assessing the impact of a new drug on blood pressure, the only thing in this situation that's going to change is the blood pressure numbers, right? This is what we're measuring in the study. So I, as you can see, that would be the dependent value um, variable. So the blood pressure is dependent on something to cause it to change. And in this case, it will be the independent variable, which uh, in this case would be the, the new drug. Okay, next slide. We have discrete versus continuous data. Discrete data is data that can take only certain values. Okay, so compared to continuous data, which could be any number, right? Like one to gazillion, right? I don't even know if that's actually a real number or whatever, but it could fall into any place between that one to a gazillion. It could be decimal, um, or it could be whole numbers. That's that's continuous data. Discrete data has to be whole numbers only. So, for example, the number of students in a class. You can't have half of a student, right? So that would be discrete data. But when it comes to continuous data, that data could take any value so if you let's say you calculate the average of people's height in the United States right that value could fall into any number right it could be any number it could be decimal it could be whole numbers an example that I added here the GPA of a student right so a GPA of a student can have decimals blood pressure blood pressure cannot really have decimals right so that would be discrete data Okay, compared to something like you're checking the patient's HB uh, hemoglobin A1C. So that's something that could fall into any value because you can have decimals for that. Next is risk. Um, so risk is simply the probability of something occurring out of the whole sample, right? So it's usually an unfavorable event. So in a group of 100 people, what is the risk, right? What is the chances that one of them would develop a stroke? So it's the probability of an event occurring out of the whole sample. So a new drug was studied for the prevention of lung cancer. 100 patients were given the drug and monitored for the development of lung cancer. At five years, they found that 30 patients developed lung cancer out of the total sample of 100, okay, so 30 people had the probability, or you could just say 30 people developed the unfavorable event out of the whole sample. So in this case, when you're calculating the risk, it will be the number of people that developed the unfavorable event out of the total, okay? So in this case, like you wouldn't do 30 divided by 30 people with stroke divided by 70 people who didn't develop the stroke. But instead you do 30 people who developed the stroke out of the total 100 who didn't develop the stroke. I mean, out of the, the total 100 whole sample. So that will include people that developed the stroke and who people who didn't develop the stroke. Next we have relative risk, sometimes known as risk ratio. And this is the ratio between the risks, okay, of like usually two groups. So in, in clinical studies, they usually compare two things, right? So you have 
the intervention group, um, and you have the placebo group, right? So we're going to give this drug to patients to see if it can prevent this. We're going to give placebo to patients to see if it can prevent this. Notice that in each group, you can actually calculate the risk, right? So in the treatment group, I could say when I gave the drug to all of them, right, 50 of them developed a stroke, for example, compared to out of 100 in the treatment group. In the placebo group, we gave 100 people the placebo, but 70 developed a stroke out of the 100. So you have two risks in each group, right? You calculate the risk in each group. And for relative risk, it's just the ratio between those groups now, the risk ratio. So let's just keep going, you understand more. So this is also known as the probability of developing an unfavorable event in one group compared to the other group, right? Probably the probability of developing an unfavorable event is known as risk, right? Calculation, risk and treatment group divided by risk and placebo. So drug A caused a stroke in 26 out of 50 total sample, and placebo caused a stroke in 20 out of 50 sample. Okay, so the risk of, and notice how I said total sample, okay, so it has to be the total sample. So the risk of a stroke in an intervention group will be 26 out of a total of 50, right? In other words, 0.52%. The risk of a stroke in the placebo group will be 20% out of 50, okay, or 0.42%. Just notice that in each situation, it may change, like, just the whole scenario. So in this case, we want to see if the drug, right, the intervention is the one that's, like, causing the stroke, not preventing. In this case, the intervention is not trying to prevent the stroke. So that's why, like, in our case, we have more patients who develop the stroke in the intervention group, which is fine. It doesn't change anything much. So the relative risk in this case is 0.52 divided by 0.42. So 0.52 coming from the interventions group risk, we're gonna divide that by 0.42 coming from the placebo group risk, okay? And it's 1.3. So how do you really interpret that? So when the relative risk is greater than one, it means that the risk of an unfavorable event is higher in the numerator, okay? So in this case, in the treatment group, it's higher in the numerator compared to the denominator. So example, a relative risk of 1.4 means that the risk of developing an unfavorable event is 40% more likely to occur in the treatment group versus placebo group. Also keep in mind that depending on where the intervention group is in the ratio, it may change the interpret, uh, interpretation also. It doesn't really matter. Usually you wanna keep the one with the highest, like if you go back here, right? You wanna put the, it's usually better to put the highest, the one with the highest risk on the top, right? So whether it's the placebo group or it's the treatment group, you wanna keep that on top, okay? And when you're interpreting it, you just have to switch it around in that case. So if the placebo group was the one with the highest risk, we would say that, and we got 1.4, we would say that the risk of developing an unfavorable event is 40% more likely to occur in the placebo group versus treatment group, right? So the verse part is like, a, it's like a ratio. So this compared to that, that's all I was trying to say. And we have relative risk less than 1%. So once again, the risk of developing, the risk of an unfavorable event is lower in the numerator compared to the denominator, okay? So the smaller your number gets when you calculate the relative risk, it means that the numerator is probably much smaller or it's smaller compared to the denominator. So example, a relative risk of 0.75 Right? It means that the risk of developing an unfavorable event is 25% less likely to occur in the treatment group versus placebo. So because the treatment group is on the top, that's why I interpret it this way. 
But let's say if the placebo group is on top, right, and you get 0.75. So 0.75 means that the risk of developing an unfavorable event, right, you could say is going to be 25% more likely, right, to occur in the, uh, you could say it's 25% less likely, sorry, to occur in the placebo group compared to the treatment group. That depends on where you put the placebo group or treatment group in the ratio. If it comes first in the numerator compared to the denominator. So when you're interpreting it, sorry, I just had to like sip some coffee because it's really early. So when you're interpreting it, it really depends which not which uh which group came first. Okay. A relative risk of one. That means the risk of unfavorable event is equal in the numerator and denominator. So in this case, it doesn't matter where the it doesn't matter which one is the numerator, whether it's the treatment group or the placebo group, it's a one to one ratio, right? So you're just gonna lead to one regardless. Next we have relative risk reduction. If you list if you pay attention to the name, it's it's kind of giving away exactly what it is. So this is the percent of the percent reduction in risk in the treated group compared to the control group. Okay, so that's why we say that. So let's say the treatment group we usually expect to do good, right? Like reduce the risk of something compared to the placebo group. So relative risk reduction will allow you to calculate that. So the calculation is one minus the relative risk. Okay, in decimal, or if you don't put in decimal, it's going to be 100 minus the relative risk. But the relative risk has to be in percent. So the relative risk, let's just say, is 0.61 or 61%, right? So keep in mind, it's also less than 1. So it depends on what we were interpreting. So let's we could use the same example from here, right? So we are looking at developing like a stroke, right, compared to like treatment group compared to the placebo group. We did that calculation, we found 0.61. So 0.61, it means that the risk of the stroke, right? Is it more in the treatment group or placebo group? In the treatment group, because like I said, the treatment group is on the top. So it's more likely in the treatment group. So you got 0.61%. So you could say, okay, the risk of developing a stroke, right, is going to be, what, 39% less likely, okay? Matter of fact, let's just go to the interpretation slide so that you guys can see. Oh, here we go, sorry. So once you get the relative risk, then you want to subtract, right? So you want to subtract 1 minus that, so 100 minus that, 39%, or 0.39. And then the interpretation on the next slide. So the first thing you want to do is analyze the relative risk. In this case, it's 0.61. Okay. Now the relative risk is less than 1, so the risk of a stroke is lower in the treatment group. So therefore, the relative risk reduction of 39% means that the treatment group reduced the risk of the stroke by 39%. Or if you take this medication, you are 39% less likely to likely to develop a stroke. So I just wanted to clarify something to prevent any confusion. Here, what I've noticed is that I put that the relative risk is 0.75, and it means that developing on on February events, 25% less likely, right, to occur in the treatment group versus placebo. And the only reason why we interpreted it this way is because of, once again, the ratio. Okay? So, another thing, another way you could say this is the relative risk is 0.75, meaning that the risk of developing the stroke, you could say, is 0.75% more likely in the placebo group versus the treatment group. Okay, you can also say that. So once you subtract the relative risk from the from one 
then you know the impact, right? So that's when you can say, okay, so the intervention group actually reduced the risk of stroke by this amount. Because the relative risk, right, the relative risk is going to tell you the risk compared to the treatment group versus the placebo group, right? So in that case, we let's say we got 0.75 of the relative risk. So then we could just simply say 1 minus 0.75, right? So 0.75 is 75% more likely to develop uh, a stroke, right, in one group versus the other. Once you subtract one, if you subtract it from one, then you get the impact of the intervention group and what it reduces it by. Another way you could say this is if you take this medication, you're 39% less likely to develop a stroke. Now we have absolute risk reduction. So this is the absolute difference in outcome rates between the control and the treatment groups. So we calculate this by finding the percent risk in the control group, and we minus the percent risk in the uh, treatment group. All right? This number must be in percentage, keep that in mind, since the risk can sometimes be in decimal. Now example, so you assume that the risk of developing a stroke in the control group is 64% and 23% in the treatment group. Okay, so the risk is much higher as we can see here in the placebo group compared to the treatment group. As you can see, it's in percentage form. That's what we want. So the absolute risk reduction in this case would be 64 minus 23, which would be 41. And the interpretation, so for every 100 patients, for every 100 patients treated with this drug, 41 fewer patients experienced the stroke. Okay, so that's basically how you interpret it. Um, so once you subtract, so this is how much um, fewer people would develop the risk in the, in the uh, treatment group compared to the placebo group. Once again, if the placebo group is higher, right? You probably want to put that first, right? Placebo group, depending on what it is, right? If the treatment group has a higher risk of a stroke, it goes first. If the placebo group is the one that has a higher risk of a stroke, it goes first. And when you're interpreting it, that's going to determine everything. So if the placebo group, let's say, was the one that had the the less um, less risk of a stroke, and this is like the treatment group that had more, right? So 64 people developed a stroke out of 100. 23% develop the stroke out of 100. How do I know it's out of 100? The percent. So in that case, you would say for every 100 patients, 100 patients treated with this drug, 41 more patients actually experience a stroke, right? You could say it like that. Number needed to treat. So the number of people who need to be treated with the intervention for a certain period of time to achieve the desired outcome. A desired outcome, let's say it could be uh, to prevent a stroke, right? To cure a disease, to reduce blood pressure. And it's calculated by 1 divided by the absolute risk reduction. And the absolute risk reduction must be in decimal. Very important because in the previous slide, we had it as a percent in order to calculate it. So it must be in decimal. So the absolute risk reduction in the previous slide was actually 41%. Therefore, the number needed to treat will be 1 divided by 0.41. Okay? 1 divided by 0.41, which is 2.44. When it comes to number needed to treat, you always want to round your answer up. Okay? So, the interpretation will basically give you everything you need to know about number needed to treat. So, in this case, we need to treat 3 patients for 1 year to prevent a stroke in one patient. The one year comes is going to change based on the study, right? The study length, depending on, let's say it could be six months, two months, whatever the case is, that could change, okay? So the number needed to treat is basically trying to assess um, how good your drug is. Like, how many patients do we actually need to treat in order to, you know, have our desired outcome, right? 
So do you want to treat more patients before you have a desired outcome or less? I'll let you guys answer that. <laughs> Number needed to harm. Utilize when the intervention is bad, for example. So exposure to cigarettes or a hepatotoxic drug, or you could say a drug that causes renal toxicity. So the number of people exposed to this bad exposure in order for one, in order for harm to occur in one. Okay, so we know this medication causes these, causes this harm, right? Examples here. The calculation is one divided by the absolute risk reduction, and the ARR must be in decimal. So it's the same calculation as the number needed to treat, but like I mentioned earlier, depends on what you're looking for. The medication is causing good outcomes, good, everything good, then most likely we're not going to be looking at the um, number needed to harm, but the number needed to treat. So in the absolute risk reduction, in the previous example is 41%. Therefore, the number needed to harm will be 1 divided by 0.41, which is 2.44. Sorry. Always round your answer down in this case, all right? That's just a general rule. Interpretation, we need to expose two patients to cigarette smoke in order for one to develop a stroke. I, know, I had to, like, think. I said cigarette smoke, then when I said stroke after, I thought I said stroke twice for some reason. Okay. So that one is, like, pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Next, we have odds and odds ratio. Now, odds is the probability of an event occurring in one group. No, odds is a, sorry. Odds is the probability of an event occurring compared with the probability that it will not. 100 smokers in a study. If 40 develop a lung, lung cancer and 60 did not, the odds is 40 to 60, right? The probability of an event occurring, 40, 40 people developing the lung cancer compared to the probability of not occurring. So 40 to 60, 40 got it, 60 didn't, right? They always used to use um, the example with like a bag of marbles or something like that, different colors, right? And the probability of the probability of selecting one color compared to select not compared to um, the others, right? They usually use that as like an example. So when you do it like this, you're usually gonna get like 40 to 60, or you could do 40. 40 to 60 as a ratio, or 40 divided by 60, and when you calculate it, you're going to get something like 67%, right? But the risk in this case will be 40 divided by 100, right, which is 0.4 or 40%. So you see the difference, right? So the risk, the risk is 40 divided by the total number of people compared to, um, oh, sorry. Compared to the odds, which is just 40 divided by the people who didn't get it. So people who got it versus people who didn't develop it. So odds ratio, a measure of association between an exposure cigarettes and an outcome. The ratio of the odds in the treatment group to the odds in the, in the control group, right? It's very similar to, let's say, relative risk and relative risk reduction. So interpretation, um, so odds in the exposure group, let's say 40 developed a stroke and 60 didn't. Odds are 40 to 60 or 40 divided by 60, which is 67%, right? 67% of people develop, right? That's the odds. <laughs> um, because think about it, if it was... um. It was forty to forty. Then you're just gonna get you're gonna get one, right? So the odds of like developing a stroke compared to not developing a stroke when you uh, when you take this medication will be equal, something like that. Or you could say the odds of developing a stroke compared to not developing a stroke when you take to when you take this medication is sixty seven percent. Okay, then we have. Odds in non-exposed group, right? So 30 develop a stroke and 70 didn't. So odds of 30 to 7 or 30 divided by 7, 70, which is 0.42 or 42%.
this supposed to be odds ratio or not? Not odds ratio. Okay. Kia had two groups, so remember the odds ratio is because this just this is just the odds, right? The odds in each group, right? So forty developers so compared to sixty who did it. So we had like let's say a hundred people in the uh exposure group, right? So exposure group, let's say cigarette smoke. Forty to sixty, that's the odds. Odds in the non-exposed group, 30 to 70, point four, uh, point 0.42 or 42%. As you can see, it's less, right? So because less people develop the stroke in the non-exposed group. So you could say it's 42% more likely in this group. Here is 67% more likely. The odds ratio is just you divide those two, right? You divide this by that. Interpretation, the risk of developing a stroke is 57 times more likely in the exposed group compared to the non-exposed group, right? That's supposed to be 60, no. No, we are interpreting the odds ratio, right? So so that's when you compare, you're comparing the, uh, the two groups. So the risk of developing a stroke is 57 times more likely in the exposed group than the non-exposed group because it's greater than one here. The risk of developing a stroke is equal in the exposed group compared to the non-exposed group because the odds ratio is 1. Here is less than 1. So example, 0.63. The risk of developing a stroke is 47 times less likely in the exposed group than the non-exposed group. Okay? Can you say that it's point... Can you say... Can you, when you calculate it, right, and you get 0.63, can you just say that... The risk of developing a stroke is 63% is more likely in the exposed group than the non-exposed group. Yes, you could say it like that too, okay? That's totally fine. <coughs> All right, because when you um when you say the 47%, it's like saying odds ratio reduction. You know how we had the relative risk reduction? It's like something like that, okay? It's it's like saying what the um the other group reduce the risk or the odds by something like that. Um so either way is fine. Either way is totally fine. Okay. Also, like if you look at the numbers, right, it, it sometimes it just makes sense. Okay, so thirty developed a stroke and seventy didn't. Right? So we said that the odds is forty two percent. Right? So there's no way you you could tell me that this 42% means that um 42% means that uh it was favoring the the 42% like just compare it to this number 67%, right? Definitely more people developed it compared to here. Right? So this 67% is definitely referring to the number of people it's affected it's a it's being affected by the number of people who's developing the stroke. And the 60 who didn't, right? So this is the exposure group, and this is the non-exposure group, and the exposure group is much higher. So when you get the numbers, most likely due to the um, exposure group, the number that's on top it was much higher. So when you're interpreting it, you could you could say it based on the fact that you could use the the top number as a reference, right? And just say that. So the exposure group, you could just say that since the exposure group was much higher, you could just say it's 0.63, right? Or in this case, 57 times more likely since it was 1.57. Okay, it was 57 uh, more likely in the exposed group than the non-exposed group, right? But when it's less than one, it's 47 times less likely in the... Uh, in the exposed group than the non-exposed group, right? Less likely, 47 times less likely. Now I had to like read it also just to like make sure there's some understanding um, with this. <coughs> Sorry. So hazard ratio is used to uh, present the time a patient survived until a negative event occurred in the study. So a negative event could be anything here. Um, a death, stroke, MI, bone fracture. 
The chance of a negative outcome occurring at any given time during the study in the treatment group compared to the comparative group. The chance of a negative outcome occurring at any given time during the study in the treatment group versus the uh, comparative group. Hazard ratios are usually used with survival analyses or time to event. So with hazard ratio, we take into account the time at any given time, right? So we keep track of the time that these uh, negative events occur in the study. So with that, we can know the time to event, right? Since we're keeping track of that, we could definitely keep track. Who was the first person to develop a stroke in the study, right? At one month, at two months, how many people? At three months, how many people? At four months? Survival analyses may include a curve that tells you the number of people who experience the event at any given time in a study. This curve is known as survival curve or Kaplan-Meier curve. So this is the Kaplan-Meier curve. On the y-axis, we have the proportion of people that are alive. And the x-axis, we have time and days. And we have male in blue and females in red. So as you can see, at uh, day zero, we had everybody was alive in this study, right? So let's just say these people were exposed to cigarette smoke. Now over time, we want to know what is, like how many people are alive, right? How many people died? How many people are alive? So that's the important thing with Capital Mahaya. At any given time here, so I could come here, right? Let's just say this is half, right? At 500 days... Okay, it is the proportion of females alive in the study compared to um, here for men or something like that, right? So with Kaplan-Meier curve, you're able to see time to event, right? So we here we like they did like a very close sensitivity um, analysis. I don't know why it keeps doing that. No, no, go back. <laughs> you can see right they do like because um, the graph is not that clear for you to literally track it but you get you get the idea at any given time you could tell how many people are alive compared to how many people die right so as the study keep going on um more people they're losing more people in the study more people are being um lost because they're exposed to a negative event or a negative uh negative thing in this uh in this uh study hazard ratio versus relative risk very simple. Hazard ratio is likelihood of an event occurring in the treatment group versus the group versus the control group, right? Treatment group versus control group at any point in time of the study. So one month, two months, five months, etc. And relative risk is the same, but for the end of the study. Okay, so relative risk would be the likelihood of an event occurring in the treatment group versus the control group at any given point in the uh, in the study. No, at the end of the study for relative risk. At the end of the study. So the study is one year. We're not going to assess anything, right? We're not going to assess the likelihood of the event occurring um, in the treatment group versus the control group until the end of the study. They're calculated the same way, but the interpretation is a little different. Relative risk. The risk of developing the unfavorable event is 40% more likely to occur in the treatment group versus the placebo group. All right. The risk of developing the unfavorable event at six months follow-up is 40% more likely to occur in the treatment group versus placebo group. So that's usually how they interpret um, the hazard ratio. It usually incorporates a specific time. So everything else is basically the same. Like if we go back to the relative risk, um, relative risk uh, examples, All right? So if we get a relative risk of 1.4, this could also be, we could say it's a hazard ratio of 1.4. And it just means, it basically means that the, uh, the unfavorable event it's higher in the numerator, right? So we could say more deaths. That could be the unfavorable, the unfavorable event. We could say that's higher in the numerator. So the high hazard ratio at six months, right, of 1.4 just means that 40% more people died, right? 40% more likely 
um, to die from this uh, exposure at six months compared to the other group, right? And when he comes here also as 0.75, um, for the hazard ratio, we could say that at six months, right, 75% people, 75% um, more people develop the uh, exposure. I mean, 75% more people develop the uh, the unfavorable outcome, right? Or the unfavorable event or stroke or death. So 75% more likely, right? In the, in one group compared to the other. All right, so it depends on which group um, had the less risk in this case. So the hazard ratio will be interpreted based on that for specific uh, specific time period in the study. Um, and that brings me to the end of this video. I know there was, uh, has to clarify a lot of things um, in this video. So if you have any questions at all, just feel free to comment um, or email me or just, however, like, I guess I think you can message people through YouTube, but just, just reach out to me and I will definitely uh, clarify things for you if I need to go back and like, um, like you know, reread things so, you know, get a better understanding. I'll do that just so I could like explain it to you guys. Please feel free to give me some feedback. Like I said, I just started making these videos um, and I just want to make it as realistic as possible. So that's why I usually just do it in real time. Instead of like rehearsing or something, I just like just reading all the uh, slides, right? So I, I like doing it in real time and going through the uh, problems and examples with you guys. So until then, um, I hope to see you again and thank you.